just heard that our moderator is still in uh, court in one of the lunch sessions, or maybe at lunch, I'm not sure about that. So uh, we are going to show you... Uh, ah, Neil is... F Neil, you can have a seat, please. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> uh, we will show you in the afternoon uh, really step-by-step PFO-owned ASD cases. These are not, as far as I know, not particularly difficult. But I think you have seen in the first case this morning that even a straightforward case can uh, end up very difficult. So we, if there are any problems, these are not built in intentionally. They just happened. Uh, we will start with case number, what is that? 11. 11? OK, case number 11. Andreas, please uh, give us the case history. Our next patient is a 43-year-old male who suffered a stroke in December 2012. A PFO with an atrial septal aneurysm was then diagnosed. He currently has scotoma. His current medical history includes hypertension and hypercholesterolemia. ECG showed sinus rhythm with a heart rate of 79 beats per minute and an incomplete right bundle branch block. TTE showed good left ventricular function and borderline dilated left atrium. TTE also showed an atrial septal aneurysm and a mild mitral <coughs> regurgitation. Okay, thank you very much. So with me is uh, Stefan Berkert from our center, and Bushra Rana, she's ready to do the TEE. But the TEE is not in place yet. The only thing I have done is uh, introduce the nine French sheath in the groin, and uh, the wire is up in the uh, inferior vena cava. And I think, Stefan, would you like to cross the sure, TFO? Sure, sure. So we use a, um, a multi-purpose diagnostic five French catheter to cross the PFO. So I have given 10,000 units of heparin. We don't check ACT. I just give this as a standard dose for PFOs. And with 10,000, uh, usually all patients are within the therapeutic range. Pause? Yeah. Pause. Hi, Neil. Yeah, sorry, I was a little bit late. I had a call. Yeah, we expected so that. We expected that. No problem. I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to try some interaction here. Yeah. Good. So this is a multi-purpose type, oh, sorry, multi-purpose shape catheter. Do you ever use any other shape, like a right Judkins or something? Well, actually, during the ASD we did just before the break, I had to use, uh, and that I couldn't show that uh, online, I had used to use an uh, FR4, but I must say for PFOs, in, let's say, 99%, I'm using the, uh, the multi-purpose. When you think about crossing, you think, oh, boy, this is very boring and everybody can do this. But I have seen so many cases where the operator failed to cross it and could not close it for that reason. So uh, you should, you should, we should discuss a little bit how to do this. Yeah, good. Uh, yeah, stop, the stop. Yeah. Yeah. Stefan, okay. stop there. Don't uh, move anymore. You noticed that uh, Stefan started up in the super vena cava with the, uh, oh, sorry, the curve of the catheter pointing to the patient's left. And you would think intuitively that okay. Of course, you need to be a little bit posterior. So, if you're struggling with that, you might want to put the tube across to, LAO. to the uh, LAO projection. Uh, yeah. It's all right. Sorry to interrupt. You carry on, Stefan. Sure. But sure. come from the SBC, you yeah. see the catheter drop first into the right atrium okay. and then drop into the region of the fossa. Thanks, uh, Stefan. So uh, to, to explain to the audience, Stefan has joined our group just uh, a few weeks ago, actually. And uh, so he has done a couple of PFOs, but not hundreds of PFOs. And uh, so when, when you think about how to cross a PFO, you have to keep in mind that the atrial septum is very soft and, uh, in most cases. And that means when, when you have the septum and you try to, to cross with the catheter, if you are getting contact with the septum, then you often cannot rotate the catheter anymore because it's caught by the soft tissue of the septum. And that means you basically have to cross it without pushing against the septum. That, that's very important. And the key to do that is a little rotation all the time. And as soon as you see the catheter is, is bending, that means you are in contact with tissue and then you cannot just advance it further because it will get stuck in the tissue. That's a good point. Once the catheter starts to bend, it's already too late for manipulation, you want it fairly straight. And you didn't say whether you rotated clockwise or anti-clockwise, Horst. Good point. So uh, the rotation is usually a little bit clockwise, because that orients you more posterior. 
This looks like um, pressure is okay. So uh, yeah, wait yeah. a second. Where could this catheter be? I would like to have some comments from yeah, the audience. Okay. Where could this catheter be? Coronary sinus. Coronary sinus. Could Very be. good yeah. point. Yeah. Because why? Why is it coronary sinus and not RV or something else? Pressure. Well, yeah. Suggestions. We could. What could we do? We could take saturation. We could measure pressure. We could do an angiogram. Okay. Let's Agreed? look at the pressure. Can you change the scale, maybe? Or? Jürgen? Okay, here we are. That is the pressure. So, so it's very low very pressure. Low so, okay. it's so we're not in the ventricle. Exactly. We could, of course, be outside the heart. It's possible. Uh, good point, yeah. I hope not. Hope, hopefully not. Stefan hopes not. <laughs> could be the sinus, like you said, coronary sinus. Right? Also, the Let's good news is we've run out of... You know, seats in this uh, auditorium here. So okay, they can lay on the floor. There's enough space <laughs> the between the seats. Yeah, the it's towels. more convenient there. Okay, okay let's so let's confirm the position. Uh, we can inject a little bit of contrast very carefully. Sinus. You see, coronary yeah. sinus. So we could proceed and uh, put in a ring for mitral uh, insufficiency reduction, <laughs> he but have he, any, he doesn't, doesn't have, have any. any. Yeah. Okay, so let's go back and try to to cross again. If you want to sit down, you can get intimate with. People here, you know, find a nice looking person you want to sit next to. <coughs> it's very interesting, so actually. Um, put your hand up if you've closed PFOs before, obviously. And have you ever had a PFO referred where you couldn't cross the atrial septum? Yes? No? They're all a bit shy still. Well, I had this multiple times, and uh, sometimes yeah. so it, it's usually straightforward, as I said, but. But for someone who hasn't done hundreds, it's sometimes really difficult, and that is one of the reasons why it fails. Because when you cannot cross, then you cannot close it. Okay, that looks better. And you could see that it was a clockwise rotation, but finally brought him through. So I'm pretty sure that... Wait a second. Uh -huh. Where we are now? Just stop there. Stop well, there. Okay, yeah. let's ask. Where do you think he is? Pulmonary artery. Not sure. Pulmonary yeah, artery? not sure. Okay. We could be pulmonary artery. Any other suggestions? <coughs> Neil, do you see the pressure that tracing? Yeah. yeah. No, we're, we're the same thing. You mustn't ever assume you, you, um, um, uh, uh, aviation pilots, you know, uh, uh, airplane pilots call it confirmation bias in that you, of course, chances are we're in the left atrium, maybe not, but you <laughs> mustn't always assume that that's where it is, particularly when you're starting off. I mean, Horse done a million of these, he's more confident and he knows how the catheter feels when you manipulate it. But you mustn't always just assume you're in left atrium. You're right, somebody said we could be pulmonary artery or okay. in the right ventricular outflow tract. We could be outside the heart again. We could be in the right atrial appendage, pushing up the right atrial appendage. So it's get back to the basics really of what do we do now? We measure the pressure. And you're okay. gonna say, Stefan, the pressure? Let's, like let's see atrial, the pressure. Yeah. Jürgen? I don't know if you can see it on the screen. No, we can't. Oh, okay, okay. Let's see if we can get it on the screen. There it is. Okay, uh, can we please have uh, 50 range of the pressure yeah. or 40 range? So currently it's 200 range of scale. So yeah. this is now 50. You can see the pressure is uh, pretty low. Its uh, mean pressure is almost zero. So that could be, what could that be? Pressure is zero in that position. Well, it's likely to be an atrial structure, obviously. Yeah, now it's probably uh, perforated into the pericardium, so we are measuring the pericardial pressure here. Maybe. But there's no Maybe. tamponade yet, right? No, if it's 10. <laughs> well, if, there, if you think about tamponade, how, how to evaluate whether it's tamponade or not? Thank you. What to do to rule out tamponade? What are we going to do? I, I need some, some, some input suggestion. from the audience. What to do? Let's see the heart. Okay, we, we could uh, have a look at the um, bigger picture of the heart to see okay. if that is bigger than it started. Any Very other suggestion? Point. Actually, the size is difficult because we didn't check Injection before, but when you also. just see a bit Okay, we might uh, inject contrast. If you, can inje uh, if you can aspirate blood, then you also can inject con contrast, and then Good you point. know where you are. Yeah, but look well, at the... Could Look we at could the do an echo as well, of course. Yeah, but that's... Oh, okay, we, have, we are ready to introduce the TE Pro, but we don't have connected the transthoracic. We could do that. But look at the fluoro. 
This is a typical experience of a heart which has no pericardial effusion. I hope that we will not be able to show you a case where pericardial effusion occurs, but this is, keep this in mind. This is just by fluoro, you can rule out uh, uh, pericardial effusion. So uh, let's, let's look at the type of the catheter again. So we have pressure there, which means we now we could aspirate blood, but we could also give a little puff injection. I'm assuming, I'm assuming that we are probably at the roof of the left atrium, when I look at the picture here. But let's confirm this by, by fluoro. I inject a little bit. Wait, wait, wait. Mm -hmm. Okay, you see, we are at the, let's see this. Mm -hmm. We are at the roof of the left atrium. There's actually a small vessel coming in. Okay, so uh, what you also can see, there's a little bit filling of the uh, pulmonary veins of the left side. And actually for PFO closure, it's good to have to introduce the catheter into the pulmonary vein because that gives you a very stable position for the, for the wire which you need later on to introduce okay, the uh, now, size. Now can, you yeah. freeze, can you freeze that angiogram, please? There's yeah. something there. Yeah. I don't suppose, well, Barrett might know what it is there, little vein. That little vein. Almost certainly yeah, yeah. a vestigial um, levocardial uh, cardinal vein. So just out of interest. So you do sometimes see little things like that in the left atrium, which are not part of the uh, pulmonary veins per se. So don't be alarmed if you check your catheter position and you see something like that. Uh, Neil, uh, you have some microphones up there. So if you want to distribute them between the people, they can... Yeah. Uh, I need uh, some okay. help here. I'm single-handed. If somebody could do it, yeah, you Nicola. will get some help. I will. I will help you. I will <laughs> organize something for you. Okay. You. Good. So, what is next step? Next step okay. is to engage the uh, pulmonary vein, and obviously, you can see actually here the different branches of the uh, pulmonary vein stop, on the left stop side. Stop there. Yeah. Which which pulmonary vein do we want? Left upper pulmonary vein. Yeah. Left um, upper. Mm -hmm. Left upper. What if, what if you have difficulty getting left upper? Does it have to be left upper? No. What's wrong with right? What's wrong with the right pulmonary vein? Yeah? Any comments? Anybody want to comment about right pulmonary vein? I think it works as well, but uh, left is better. Mm -hmm. We think left's better, maybe the, uh, if you're going to balloon size, the. Um, the, the, the passage of the balloon will be somewhat yeah. easier if it's left pulmonary vein? Actually, uh, you can go to the right pulmonary vein, and it's actually very good for device deployment. But for balloon sizing, it's more difficult to really see the waste in the balloon when you have the wire in the right upper pulmonary vein. But it is doable. So I bet I, because of balloon sizing is easier, I, I prefer to the left side. Uh, is there a difference between upper pulmonary vein and lower pulmonary vein? Any comments Anybody on want that? To comment on that? I personally not too bothered. I slightly prefer upper, otherwise the wire bends down somewhat. But yeah, yeah. I, I I I agree. So I th I think for PFO you could go uh, everywhere, but uh, for for ASDs, especially large ASDs, is it gives you a more stable position of the balloon when you do balloon sizing, when you have it in the upper pulmonary vein. Okay. okay. So now. Uh, Let's different, uh, proceed and, and advance the catheter into the uh, left upper pulmonary vein. It's, by the way, unusual to get immediately into the pulmonary vein because usually when you want to close the PFO, you end up in the LAA, whereas when you want to close the LAA, you end up in the pulmonary vein. So it's a little bit uncommon here, the situation. Yes, that's the... The golden so this is rule of PFO closure. This is one of the upper pulmonary veins, but it's not really the superior pulmonary vein, so you may consider to bring it in a, in a more uh, vertical position. Cranial. Cranial, yeah. It. Cranial, okay. And the other little tip about it is when you are manipulating the catheter back, it's uh, very easy to yeah. start pointing the catheter upwards too soon, you can come right back to the contour of the heart. Don't worry, you're not going to come out of the atrial septum. But you come right back to the mediastinal contour of the heart like Stefan has, and I think that's pretty good. You happy with that, everybody? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> good. So, um, next step... Lots of very experienced 
operators in this step-by-step uh, -step session. What is the what is the experience of the op of the of the attendees regarding PFO closure? Who has not closed the PFO? Who has closed the PFO? Well, and how many? Is it ten? Is it hundred? Or what? Or, or five? What is the average experience? Okay, here? Um, you've, uh, put your hand up if you've closed PFOs in the lab. And if you haven't, but you're going to do so, do so soon, well, only one telling the truth, probably some others not telling the truth. So most people have, have done some uh, PFO closures. Mm -hmm. And more than 100, you've done more than 100. Oh, some very experienced. Good. Uh -huh. okay. <laughs> uh, Zahid's saying he's done 200, so. So he should tell us what he's doing differently. So give him a microphone as well. So here is uh, uh, the catheter is now up in the upper where, branch. Where is the other microphone, by the way? Oh, ah, thank you. Okay. Zahid? So, so the, the wire we are using the is the uh, Amplots Extra Stiff, which has a, a J tip and a three centimeter long uh, soft tip. It's OK here, because when, when it is an ASD, I would really like to have a more stable position. Then I would have preferred the wire in the more vertical uh, cranial vein. But I think okay. for PFO, it's OK here. And uh, they, um, somebody give me a reason why we use a soft tip J wire. Because uh, the soft top J wire is less traumatic. Yeah. Yeah, it's a very good point. I yeah. have actually punctured a pulmonary vein before now with the wire mm. in the pulmonary vein and uh, had hemoptysis. Thankfully, not a serious problem, but you can consider if you perforated the pulmonary vein in a patient you've just given 10,000 units of heparin to, and then you say, oh, right, we've got to reverse the heparin and you know, run the risk of thrombus now on the left side coming from pulmonary vein. Da, da, da. So it's well to be careful with a nice soft J-tip wire. Yeah, same happened to me. I had the same incidents of, and fortunately also it ended up not to be a serious complication, but uh, hemoptery and so on was not very, very comfortable, the situation. No, so no, it's, no. It's, it's a good point, yeah. So, okay, so let's, let's discuss a little bit the sizing. So we do sizing in, in all PFOs, and the reason is that we had encountered PFOs with a very large diameter. So the largest PFO I think we had was about uh, uh, 24 millimeters. Uh, so, so that's why we do balloon sizing always. And at this point, remember, we, we don't have the TE probe in place, so we cannot make a dis differentiation between with or without septal aneurysm. So uh, we always do balloon sizing. There are different sizing balloons available. One is the balloon from, uh, from uh, St. Jude, which comes with the AGA devices. Uh, and uh, the other balloon is the NUMED balloon. Uh, which has been used in the past for the NMT device, for the cardiosteel device. Uh, this is the uh, sizing balloon from, uh, from uh, Numid. Uh, Numid. Uh, it has uh, uh, markers with a distance of one centimeter between each other. You will see this better on fluoro later on. I'll just stop you there, Horst. Yeah. Uh, because it's worth thinking about this. Uh, when you, obviously, you go there and you think, I'm going from the femoral vein, the temptation is, oh, I just put a five or six French sheath in the vein. Mm -hmm. And then the next thing you know, you have your super stiff wire in the pulmonary vein and you want to do your balloon sizing. So, oh, I've got to take the five out. So um, we maybe should have said you started with the nine French sheath because you knew that that was the size sheath through which you could insert these um, sizing balloons. So just have your wits about, you can do it, put a five or six in to start with, but it just delays you a little bit. So a nine French sheath, particularly in an adult sized patient is, uh, is not a big deal. And very uh, good point, very good point. And that is especially valuable because uh, for some of the PFO devices, you may use smaller sheaths than nine French, but for the balloon sizing, you need a, a nine French. So that's why we start with a nine French uh, sheath in all that, these cases. That, 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 uh, oh. the yeah. Amplets balloon is recommended to go sheetless actually. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, because uh, they had a uh, couple of balloons with that, that tore when they were taking it out of the sheet. So do you still use the Amplats balloons through a sheet or are you I, sheetless? I personally rarely use the Amplats uh, uh, balloons and one reason is that it is recommended to use them without sheath. And at least w in my hands, I occasionally have some bleeding around the shaft of the balloon when I use them. 
which I mean it's not a serious thing, you can just compress it there, but it needs one of my hands and I have only two hands. So that's why I prefer to use a sheath. And the second reason is, is more important and that is the AGA balloon, the St. Jude balloons, requires higher filling pressure in order to achieve its nominal diameter. And uh, I, I try to keep the pressure in the balloon as low as possible. That's not important if you're dealing with small defects, but it is important when you're dealing with large defects where you want to achieve the uh, nominal diameter of the sizing balloon. And then, as I said, you need higher pressure with the St. Jude. Okay, so uh, I think we can advance the, the balloon now. I don't know if we mentioned that we used heparin once we crossed the intraatrial septum. Did no, I, I gave heparin actually yeah. at the time of the sheath because I, I know I would not do anything of transeptal puncture or so, so I gave the heparin at the time when I introduced the sheath. 10,000 units of heparin. Should we go LAO? Uh, no. Let's go to the... Yeah, sure, go ahead. I cannot hear, use the microphone. Microphone doesn't work. Uh, grab the microphone from Neil. Uh, when septum primum is overlapping the septum secundum, I really don't understand what do you measure by balloon sizing. Uh, well I've never understood the concept of balloon sizing in a PFO. I can understand balloon sizing in an ASD which is behaving with a predominantly right to left shunt. But when septum primum and septum secundum are overlapping, yeah. what do you actually measure by balloon? Uh, well, there is a real true opening, even if they are overlapping. And that is uh, anatomically determined, what is the stretch diameter. The tissue, as you know, of the interatrial septum in PFO patients may be very pliable, very soft. And that means even if septum secundum and premium overlap, they behave like an ASD if the septum secundum uh, primum is very soft. And uh, actually, the embolization rate is much higher if you undersize devices according to the balloon stretch diameter. So if you have a balloon stretch diameter of, let's say, 18 or 20, and use a regular PFO device which has 18 on one side and 25 on the other side, if you think about the St. Jude Amplatzer device, then the risk of embolization is pretty high. Uh, you, you can close, obviously, PFOs without balloon sizing. I mean, you can even close ASDs without balloon sizing. And you will not run into problems in your first 100 or 200 cases but about 1% to 2% of PFOs have really a large stretch diameter. And for these reasons, I think balloon sizing is valuable. But again, I mean, this is an ongoing debate, and you, you, you can do many PFOs without balloon sizing. Uh, the second information I want to obtain from balloon sizing is the shape and the length of the tunnel. Uh, again, 95% of the PFOs are regular PFOs. There's nothing special, not a long tunnel. But occasionally, the <coughs> tunnel is very stiff, and then you, you see a long waist, a bony shaped waist of the sizing balloon. And that indicates that I would prefer a different device, uh, not, uh, not a regular uh, double umbrella device, but something which is either an internal device or which has uh, uh, something like the Premier device, which has a variable distance between right and left atrial disc. The point is, we, we call it balloon sizing, but of course, Okay, the size is a little bit important, but you get so much more information about the atrial septum by inflating a balloon across it, I think, as you, as you say. Okay. So now we, uh, with this uh, echo machine, this is not echo machine, the angel machine has uh, ISO calibration. So we will bring the table in a height which is, shows us the balloon in the center of the picture. Can you show me? Okay. So now the balloon is in the center, which means we don't have to calibrate according to the markers, what we could do, but instead we could use uh, the isocentric calibration. That means we can do our measurements directly without Just uh, additional stop step. there. Stop yeah. there, Horst. Yeah. Um, somebody's going to criticize your fluoroscopy and radiological uh, techniques there. Okay. What can you see that on that screen that shouldn't be there? Uh, I don't see anything which is wrong. Yes, you do. No. Anybody? I know what you mean, but you are wrong. The arms are in the way, though. Yeah, but that's the arms of the patient. I know. Should, should we remove them? I don't like it. So should we really? remove them? He needs I his arms. Like we cannot remove them. Well, it's actually, uh, Neil, I understand your point, but this is just to focus the table in the correct height. I just want to make sure that the balloon's in the middle of the picture. Don't now like I'm already it. back. Uh, now I'm in AP projection. I don't like it. 
Don't like it? Okay, <laughs> Let, give him another Don't fluoro. Like give him another fluoro. There are Speed young up. people. Yeah. There are young okay. people in this audience who are young and impressionable. And if they see Professor Sievert doing it, they'll go back to their labs and they'll say, it's okay, Sievert does it. But you don't see anything here. Look at the no picture. No argument. I'm Even the guy your, wife, your wife, who is a radiographer, agrees <laughs> with me. She's <laughs> nodding at the back there. Nicola, I, yeah. I have to talk to you, Nicola. Okay, advance. Uh, can, w wait, wait a second. Uh, is the position of the balloon now correct to do balloon sizing for the PFO? Some okay. opinions from the audience. Yeah, let's... Uh, See, there's somebody experienced here. Come on, girls. <coughs> why not? Why not use they ice? Want to look with the, they want to see with the echo, which isn't as it isn't unreasonable. But here we are now. What are we going to do? Looks okay, doesn't it? Well, it looks okay, but I actually don't have much experience in balloon sizing of the PFOs. Okay. Yeah, we think it's uh, reasonable anyway. Okay. I think it's, it's right at the spot of the PFO. Uh, for an ASD, when I do balloon sizing in ASD, I would like to have the balloon a little bit higher, I fill it in the left atrium, and then pull it back. But here it might be okay if we start here. Now, the major concern for balloon sizing is obviously, beside the additional efforts you undertake, is that you stretch the, um, the defect by inflating the balloon too much. And actually, that happened just a few weeks ago, and we are going to publish that. But uh, this is the major concern, and, and the best way to avoid oversizing, overstretching of the defect is what? What is the best way to avoid overstretching of the, of the, uh, of the defect? Barrett? Barrett's going to give To preferably do it under ultrasound guidance? That's an option. Yeah, that's an option. Then you have to look on ultrasound. You have to look how the balloon is filling. You have to look for residual flow. Yeah. And I mean, this really depends upon the echocardiographer, whether he is able to catch that area where is residual flow. And you have to be 100% sure that this is not a multi-fenestrated defect. Because obviously, you may uh, enter one defect, overstretch it, and then maybe misled by a, by a second defect where you see still flow and you think you can inflate more. Any other suggestions how we avoid overstretching? Pressure, no pressure. Okay, so connect up to your manometer. Yeah, that's what we have done now. Right. So, so the lumen of the balloon is connected to the pressure line. And when we can see pressure now, you can see there is a waveform of pressure, uh, which is the pressure inside of the balloon. Can you see the pressure? Uh, we need a bigger screen, and we need the, uh, again, on a 20 scale or something like that. Uh, it's in the 50 scale, but we can go to 20 scale as if well. If you make it 20 scale, and if mm -hmm. you could, if it, yeah, that's much better. Yeah, OK. But we still want 20 scale, if you can. OK, we try to work on 20 scale. You can see that the pressure is 3 over minus 1 or minus 2. Mean pressure is 0. You can see the waveform, which uh, is the same pressure waveform as for the right or left atrium. Uh, but this is measured inside of the balloon. And uh, when I see this pressure curve, I know that there's already some fluid inside of the balloon. If there's no fluid at all, if the balloon is completely empty, then I may not be able to see this pressure form. Let me simulate this here. I'm, I'm aspirating now as much as I can out of the lumen of the balloon. And now you see there's no pressure. That means there's no fluid inside of the balloon. And as soon as I give one cc or two cc, now you see the waveform again. OK, so now we can uh, uh, carefully uh, inject a little bit contrast and watch the balloon. And we will also all the time watch the pressure inside of the balloon. And it's important to avoid any increase of pressure in the balloon, let's say above the value of 15 or 20. Because as long as you do that, you can be sure that um, you are not stretching the defect. Okay? Host, um, look at this. I wanted to make a suggestion. Yeah. Oh, sorry, a comment. Mm. Um, you didn't explain about the dilution of the contrast for the balloon. Yeah, it's actually not. I, I injected the little, the first cc or two cc of fluid was saline, and now I'm injecting uh, a contrast. It doesn't really matter. You should avoid a full injection of 100% contrast, because then you cannot see the markers anymore. It's not so important with this um, uh, 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 fluoro equipment here, because we have this isocentric calibration. 
But if you don't have that, you want to use no. the distance between the markers for calibration. And it if it the balloon is fully with uh, it contrast, se you it seems see. a It seems an obvious thing, but just the occasional labs that are used to coronary work and inflating coronary balloons, a lot of the scrub nurses think this is some sort of angioplasty balloon, and they give you, you know, half-strength contrast or even more. And as you say, you obscure the, yeah. the uh, calibration points. Yeah. So just uh, one in three, one in four, something like that. I, uh, I have a ah, question, Horst, um, yeah. about, you, you remember you were just asking where the level of the wire is or the balloon is in, uh, in relationship to the atrial septum? So what fluoroscopic markers do you use? Well, this is actually not a fluoroscopic marker. It's more a gut feeling. I'm, I'm, I'm basically looking at the shadow of the heart on the right end of the screen. Uh, I'm looking at the diaphragm. I'm looking at the vertebral uh, vertebra. I know that I'm in about uh, 39, 40 degree LAO, and just my gut feeling tells me that the balloon is a little bit too low, and that is confirmed now, because when you look at the current image, you can see that the majority of the balloon is filled below the septum, and you see a small part which is compressed inside of the PFO tunnel, which is uh, at the upper marker, at the level of the upper marker, right. uh, which tells me we should advance the balloon a little bit more so that half of the balloon is in the right and half of the balloon is in the yeah, left atrium. But so the reason Zahid has a good point in uh, that if you want to... So I see the reason is the that the diaphragm, the right sided diaphragm, if it is elevated, it gives us the false impression that the septum will be much higher. Mm -hmm. See the right diaphragm? And then yeah. older the patient, the higher the diaphragm. So yeah. compared to pediatric population, where the diaphragm are usually flatter because they are under anesthesia, see how the diaphragm is elevated? So it gives us the false impression the septum may be actually higher. Yeah. Actually, and it's not. That's why, that's why I use uh, a kind uh, of uh, combination of everything. I see also the diaphragm on the other side, but obviously both diaphragm can, could be higher. Uh, but I look at the shadow of the heart, I look at the bony <laughs> landmarks. So it's a combination of everything. No, there's, a, there's an easier way, Horst. Yeah. You just take the halfway point. I mean, I take the point about elevated right diaphragms, but take halfway between the, uh, sorry, right diaphragm, if you're in the LAO projection, that is, halfway between the right diaphragm and where the wire leaves the, uh, contour, of the, uh, leaves the contour of the heart, measure halfway, and that sh won't, mm -hmm. uh, you won't be far off the atrial septum. Then. Yeah, good point, and it's true in this case as well. Yeah, agree. Mm -hmm. Of course it's true, that's why. Of I course, said you said it. I mean, otherwise, you <laughs> could. <laughs> stupid, stupid comment from you. <laughs> okay. So now let's, uh, we, we, as I said, we are a little bit too low. We have the majority of the balloon is filled in the right atrium. So the question is, can we just advance the balloon, or do we have to deflate it when we do this? Good question. We're going to deflate or <coughs> just advance a bit. You've hardly got any contrast in there. Wouldn't be much harm advancing, particularly with that volume of contrast in. But uh, Barrett wants you to. He wants to. Barrett wants you to deflate and then advance. I would. Uh, I would like you to deflate and then advance. Yeah, okay, you are right, and it's not, nothing wrong with that, but actually in this particular setup we were able to just advance it, and that is because we are measuring the pressure inside of the balloon. So, uh, so Stefan, if you just carefully advance the balloon without changing anything else, and watch the pressure, what the pressure does. Horst, we have a comment about whether you ever find cranial angulation uh, helpful at this stage or not. I found it not helpful because it's, it's really in the same plane. So there's no reason to, to uh, go for You see the pressure is going up a little bit, but this is a scale here. So now we can actually record this, sin of this. The pressure is going up to 10. So that is for sure, with a pressure of 10, you are not able to, dis to, de uh, to overstretch the septum. Okay, okay now we, we see a, ni a nice waist. But I'm, going to ask, I'm going yeah. to ask a question about this balloon inflation from Lucy, who's trying to ignore me. Lucy, so we're balloon, we're balloon interrogating, that's the word I like, rather than just sizing. We're balloon interrogating the atrial septum. Yeah? Uh, there's something missing from this picture. What is it? Are you sure? I would think. I know what uh, horse is going to do in a minute. He's just getting ready to do it, but if we're... He's got a manometer, so he's measuring the pressure, but... What else do you want to know when you're inflating that balloon? Could there be shunting from 
another defect or something like that, right? So would be really good practice to see this balloon dilation with the uh, with with echo. I mean, mm -hmm. it's perhaps a little more relevant for uh, for ASTs, but I think it's still very valid for uh, PFOs also. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's a very good point because that was a good suggestion, Lucy. By the way, uh, <laughs> it's a very good point. Uh, because uh, you don't know really whether we are through the PFO, it could be an additional defect, or the other way around, it could be uh, we are through the PFO, but there may be an additional defect. Oh, just, no, 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 uh, just, okay, just okay, 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 okay. He's deflating the balloon. <laughs> Surely, huh? Show me again. You want to show something show again? All okay. Right, I, we can so inflate yeah. the balloon again. A little contrast. Just out of interest, Horst. Yeah. Um, oh, Stefan, really. Stefan? Yeah, yeah. Uh, what's your total experience, clinical um, catheter experience of closing PFOs? Personally. Very little. 15? Very little. 15? Oh, oh Five? maybe 15, I don't know. <laughs> 10, 15 at the most. Okay. Probably more. He is very uh, shy. Under, under, under close supervision, let's put it that way. Okay. So now we are inserting the TE probe. As you know, our patients are mostly German patients. That means we don't need general anesthesia. It's just... Uh, even, Mild sedation or no sedation at all? Did you give anything? So no, nothing. No metazolam, no propofol. Okay, we will try without. Okay. So the GE probe is in. No desedation, no mild sedation, nothing. Okay. It's very important to talk to the patient. So uh, Julia is doing this and keeping Let's good see. contact with him. You do some adult patients, yes? You do some adult patients. Who does some adult patients? Put your hand up if you do adult patients. And in your institution, what do you do for transesophageal echo? Do you do sedation or...? or General anesthesia. Mm -hmm. Anybody just under no, sedation in their labs? Yeah, quite a number, quite a number. So okay. you're not so alone, uh, you're not alone. And German um, people aren't necessarily the bravest compare. patients in the world. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, so now... Uh, Busha, do me, do me a favor and uh, put off the color first, without color, and please focus on the aortic root in 30 degree. Okay, so now we want to rule out additional defects, and the way we can do this uh, mostly reliable is to watch the aorta, the aortic root, or maybe the ascending aorta, whatever is easier to obtain. Bushra, do you mind if I ask, could you just turn the gains up, please? Because I can't, I I can't hear you, actually. Oh. oh. Um, What's going on? I, I, I can't hear. I okay, can't. She, okay. Uh, he wants you to uh, increase the gain, and someone has to check uh, his earphone. Okay. I don't have an earphone. Okay. Yeah, we still need more gain. More gain, okay. Good. Better. It's better, better now? Okay. Yeah, better. Thank Good. You. Now, please focus only on the, uh, on the aortic, uh, ascending aorta or aortic valve. Mm -hmm. I will put my, my foot on fluoro to make sure that the balloon is uh, closing the uh, PFO. And now, via the side arm of the uh, nine French sheath, I can inject uh, and aspirate and inject and aspirate. <laughs> So you yeah. see the contrast, I'm Quiet, just yeah. nothing special, I'm just aspirating blood and re-injecting it. And you can see how the right atrium is filled with contrast, but there is no contrast appearing in the aortic root. Who wants okay. him to measure the balloon with echo? Measure the balloon? We can echo? do this, just yeah. let me stop Anybody? this test here. Somebody come on, help me. Riz, measure the balloon with echo, yeah. Yeah, I've got sound now. Okay, so we have I take it in, uh, I think I know the answer, but it's just good for the, um, for the audience. In, yeah. in uh, your institution in Papworth, yeah. you, do, uh, you do full GA for this procedure? We yeah? do, yes, yeah. yep. Okay. We do. But she is changing now, so this yeah. is, uh, she's <laughs> in the transition of doing it a lot, because uh, she wants to grit, get rid of all the difficulties <laughs> with anesthesia and the logistics and so on. And, yeah, I don't and as you know, in the UK, they mm -hmm. are working under much more time pressure than <laughs> yeah. anywhere else in the world. That's right. So it's that's a very important... That's because the days only contain 15 hours in the yeah. UK. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Um, and we, the audience were asking if you mind uh, uh, measuring the diameter of the balloon. Yeah, so of course, which is much more accurate than angiography. Yeah. Of so course. The way, the way I would measure it is I try and make sure that I'm, 
I can see the shaft of the balloon, so I see the profile of the balloon all the way through, so whatever view that takes me, so around 62 degrees in this particular view, I can see the whole length of the balloon, and I know that I'm seeing hopefully the center of it there. And then once I've got that view, uh, we, do, we normally put color on to make sure we've obstruct, there's no uh, abnormal flow, and there isn't, and then at that stage I will freeze the image, and then once I've got a picture, good enough picture. <coughs> well, I'll it's a good practical the image. point about the balloon because, of course, the uh, the balloon arcs away from you from anterior to posterior Careful. as it goes across the atrial septum, and it would be easy to sort of foreshorten. Yeah. So I'm just going to measure the outside of the waist. Oh, I've got the wrong. How do I do that? Sorry. Yeah. It's very important to have an experienced echocardiographer. Like yeah, a cardiologist there, so... How do I measure Have that? Have you got one, Horst? I just sure. a caliper, just to pick up and measure? It's, it's, uh, it's very important here to really measure the maximum diameter of the balloon, because if, you are, uh, if your plane is just out of the center of the balloon, actually That's I would great. measure a little bit, little bit more so we've tight. Got, huh? we've got six, seven millimeters there. Okay, good. Yeah, and um, what I try and do is do this on X-plane as well. Ah. So if I can just get that view again. Who has the luxury of 3D when they're doing this procedure, usually? Not very many people. Busha, yeah. is it OK when I remove the balloon now? It is, yeah. OK. Uh, uh, one more thing, if you can just very briefly show a long axis view of the septum. A long axis view, 90 degree. Long axis and, view. And the reason I'm yeah. asking for that is this is the best way to make sure that we are really through the PFO and not yeah. through a small ASD. And that is now because you can see the balloon is touching the septum secundum, which is the septum coming from above, from yeah. the right side of the screen. Yeah. And, and that ensures that we are really going through the PFO, not through an, any additional ASD, which may be there. Okay. So is, are you happy with that view? Yeah? Does yeah. that give okay. you... Okay, good. So now we are deflating the balloon. I thought Stefan was doing this procedure, Horst. Get your hands away. No, no, that's well, okay. I'm just that's assisting. Okay. Yeah, right, right. Come it's on, so Stephan. difficult. You cannot believe this, how difficult it is to just assist. It's I unbelievably know. I difficult. Know. That's why I'm telling you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, so now you can flush the sheath. Okay, now, Bushard, some, some comments about the morphology of the PFOs and anything special. Can you describe what you see? Well, the first thing that's striking is the um, uh, aneurysmal septum. Mm -hmm. um, I would, uh, I can go through and I just have a quick look, then I can give you a bit more of a comment. What's your definition of an aneurysm, uh, 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 Bushard? Anything that jumps around quite a lot. <laughs> Okay, so you don't measure it then? Well, um, we, we used to. I don't know how that helps. What I normally do is look at the attachments of the primary septum um, of the opening of the PFO okay. to work out how sturdy the opening is and then work out how um, mobile the fossa is according to that. So uh, I kind of don't think of it in those terms. And if I may just, just go around quickly and have a look at the other views. I'm just making sure I can't see anything else on the septum, so I'm just, I always do everything in colour compare. So I'm looking around zero degrees, high, mid and low, and then I go around to 50, and then round to uh, 90 degrees, a long axis view, and just make sure, and just sweep the septum and make sure I can't see anything there. Um, so far I can just see the PFO with the aneurysmal septum. And okay. um, I'm going to ask uh, Riz here in the audience, he's one of our uh, senior registrars in Oxford. Riz, will you... You, you've seen us, we, and it's more for research purposes, but there's another structure that we consider quite important in the promulgation of right to left shunting at atrial level. Tell the audience. A eustachian valve, uh, specifically a, uh, that with a long, uh, long valve, which we term malign, which directs blood towards the uh, fossa. Can you, can you see a... Um, the eustachian valve, Bushra, are you bothered about it anyway, or um, you recognize just, it as an observation? Just having a look now. So I'm giving you the right atrial view at the moment. 
Um, and if I can just freeze it at the right moment. So just to give you your bearings, up here is the SVC, down here is the IVC. This structure in here is a coronary sinus. You can see the fossa ovalis sitting here, and this is the, uh, the catheter coming through, where the balloon was up, going through the PFO at the top of the fossa there. And what you see is this, what I call a eustachian ridge, coming down towards between the coronary sinus and the mouth of the IVC. There's no um, actual uh, eustachian ridge attached, uh, eustachian valve attached to it, but there's a ridge there that potentially, if you put a too big a device in, could cause a problem in, 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 our, in our assessment. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. So now we, are, we have to make a decision regarding the device. Um, uh, as I said in this morning for this uh, live demonstration, we have kind of pre-selected all patients for certain devices. Uh, uh, when you look at the morphology, does anybody in the audience believe that we have to prefer one of the devices which are available, or is the opinion that we can use any of these devices? For this and particular, so for this p particular PFO. Um, Zahid thinks you can use just about anything, really. So it's a matter okay. of either personal preference, mm -hmm. maybe cost, um, maybe how you feel about the potential complications. Uh, just ask the, them. I mean, notwithstanding the major complications of perforation, um, let, let's talk about some potential risks, either immediately or thereafter of putting devices in the atrial septum? Want to tell us, Kalfan? Embolization. That's device embolization. Anything else? I think I had one case with a late pericardial effusion because the wire was in the left atrial appendage and it was not visible there during the examination. Late complication. Thinking more of rhythm things. Um, increased risk for future atrial fibrillation. Yeah. I mean, there there are some devices that are reported to um, have more problems with atrial fibrillation, either uh, uh, in, in the early days um, after implantation. And I know your some of your doctorates did a study about that, Horst. Yeah. I don't know if you want to summarise that no, for us no, or not. Yeah. But uh, sorry, I, I was distracted. Can you repeat your question, please? We, we, we were talking about the choice of device, and we pretty much agree uh, any of the, the currently commercially available devices would do, and so it's down to personal preference, whether you think the safety profile is better with some, whether it's cheaper, okay. um, so whether the, the, you know, there's less risk of atrial fibrillation, things like that. Okay, so we have uh, looked at this in many, in many different studies, and there are some, as you said, some devices which have a higher incidence of atrial fibrillation or thrombus formation. These are the devices we don't use anymore. So, for example, uh, the Cardiocele Starflex is not available even anymore, which had a high rate of atrial fibrillation and thrombus formation. Also, the old device from Cardia had a high incidence of uh, thrombus formation. That's not the case anymore, seems not to be the case anymore with the newer generation devices. And uh, yeah, then when it comes to erosion, we had a patient who had erosion and tamponade due to a PFO device, uh, but the numbers is so small. It, we had just one single case, so I cannot really say that uh, uh, this is related to that particular device. It was an Amplatz device, but it could have been all other devices as well. So this patient, uh, okay, then, then patients with a very long tunnel, as I said earlier, these are patients I think I prefer a device was dedicated for long tunnels. And the reason is that I think the cause of atrial fibrillation after PFO closure can only be distortion of the septum. There's not, no other mechanism which can cause atrial fibrillation in the setting. And therefore, I think if there's a long tunnel, I prefer a device which does not uh, compress the tunnel and change the morphology of the tunnel. This particular patient, there's no long tunnel. Uh, Buschauer, what is the overlap between septum secundum and primum? There doesn't I seem to be very much at all in my it's looking very at small, this. Huh? Yeah, very small, very few. Yeah. So it's not a long tunnel, not on no. echo and also not no. on fluoro. We didn't see a long tunnel there. 
That means we can use any of the umbrella devices. This particular patient was kind of pre-selected for the Octotech device, but we could also use the AGA device or the PFM device or uh, uh, any other device which is uh, designed in that configuration. Okay, now regarding the size, um, uh, usually the standard diameter for PFO closure device is 25 millimeters. And uh, so we have here six millimeters, six point something, seven millimeter diameter with the balloon mm -hmm. measured on echo and on angiography. Uh, should so I change that strategy? Should I go no, for a different size? Or now remember, Horst, it's Stefan's decision. Yeah, yeah. We you could you could go with Put an the 18. Camera on if, it's Stefan, five, if it's five, six uh, millimeters, you could go with an 18, I think. Uh, but I think you, li you like to use a larger size usually. No, for no, no, Stefan, <laughs> it's your decision. <laughs> you, you could certainly use an 18, yes. Okay, good. Yes, I will take a poll. 18 millimeters. No sense in uh, putting too much metal in the, in the heart. Yeah, that's kept the boss quiet now. Okay, open the 18 millimeter device, please. <laughs> Okay, so um, the, the disadvantage of a device which is too small is not only risk of embolization, which uh, is probably low with that diameter here. The other risk is that the right atrial disc may slip into the tunnel, which does not mean that the device embolizes, but there may be a higher risk of residual shunt. Well, so can you show us, please, the... Oh, sorry. Sorry. Hmm. Yep. Again, yeah. Again, ask for the long axis, you know, a bicable view, say yeah. 90 or 100. Yep. Now, Horst, come on. I, 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 18 millimeters. Look, yeah, I think it's Bushra, okay. if you yeah. freeze, do you mind freezing the uh, image you have there yeah. with yeah. the catheter in the middle? Yeah. And just but maybe draw a line 18 or 20 millimeters See, but the long. problem is, Neil, usually when I say something, I'm usually wrong in the end. So you might want to go with the 25. No, 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 no. <laughs> come on. No, be brave, be brave. Yeah. Yeah. Let's ex oh, okay, so how to introduce the how device there? We, we, we are using a, a, a long sheath, the Mullins sheath, so. and this is probably nine French, is it? What is it? Okay. Uh, nine French, no, okay, nine a, French long Mullins sheath. Yeah, you see, easily, and easily enough, and it's going to sit beautifully there um, um, as, astride the... the uh, Septum secundum. Okay, we see. Uh, we need primal. the echo, Jung. We need the echo. <laughs> uh, did you see the measurements? I didn't. See. Oh, sorry. Uh, I can show can you. Them. Can you show it again? Yep. Okay. Okay. What is the diameter you measured there? 18. Is it 18? Okay, yeah. that looks good. Huh? Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Stefan. You are right. <laughs> but we'll see in a moment. If I'm <laughs> right. Yeah. And the audience was right too. Well, half okay. of them. Anyway. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's a big joke, isn't it, that we go to all this trouble of interrogating the PFO, and as you say, then we put a 25 millimeter device in. Well, I'm more, so. uh, well actually, I'm more concerned about big PFO. So, so uh, uh, if the diameter is more than, than, let's say, 14, 15, then I don't use a 25 millimeter device oh. anymore. Do 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 Dr. Morgan's busy checking his Facebook profile, so this is a good time to ask him, <laughs> what would make you That's put a slightly larger device? It's a relatively small hole, but what would make you put a slightly larger device in there? What morphological features? <coughs> secundum septum. So if there's, a, if there's a bulky secundum septum, then to try and allow a more comfortable splay and make sure the device sat nicely, maybe a bigger device would be better. Any other feature that might Make mm -hmm. you use a slightly bigger device? Okay, I'm learning. You're learning, good. Are you enjoying it? Not a doctor. You can still give an opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, David. Well, uh, I, I, I tend to uh, use a, a slightly larger diameter device when the atrial septum is particularly aneurysmal. Um, so I think both of those things, as uh, Dr. Morgan says a thick, thick septum secundum and a rather redundant, redundant uh, aneurysmal septum. I think that would forgive now you. Let's, let's going focus. To let's focus what Stefan is doing Z here Zahid's because got a we, we now have to de-air the sheath, and uh, Stefan is putting the half of the sheath far below zero, and now he will open the uh, remove the, the the syringe. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, we can see. It. Remove the syringe and let it back bleed. It won't. Yeah. Okay, it won't. It will not back bleeding. Okay, so if it is not back bleeding, what to do now? We have to hurry up a little bit because we have now stasis inside of the catheter. The okay. first step is to gently uh, aspirate a little bit of blood. 
and, and check whether that is possible or not. But only no. gently. Very gently. No, no. It's not possible. Otherwise. Okay. So the reason is uh, then that the tip of the sheath is in contact with the vessel wall. Yeah. So can you fluoro, please? Okay. But so we are not in the pulmonary vein yeah. anymore. Okay. So now try again to aspirate gently. You pull it back a little bit. There's something you could have done that would have made, what? would have prevented that. Anybody got a comment? What might he have done? Yeah, Dexy. You can take the dilator out and leave the wire in and let it bleed around the wire. Did you hear that uh, yeah. point? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's actually a, that's, that's what I like to do. Yeah. That's a good point. The disadvantage of doing that is that it may be that air gets into the sheath between the valve of the of the sheath and the wire. So, but but this is certainly an option. You just have to be careful. Now we have some backflow here, and now. Stefan, can you rotate the valve and show us how to get rid of the, of the air inside of the valve? Okay, there's a bubble coming out. Now he's pointing it down, another bubble comes out. Okay, this is the technique to de-air the valve. I'll just uh, make a little comment about this cook sheath that you have there, which, you know, it's been a great uh, sheath. It's was designed quite a long time ago, and the thing that uh, worries me a little bit about it is that even though you've got back bleeding, quite profuse back bleeding there, the, if you like, the lure end, the hemostatic valve end of that sheath isn't uh, transparent. And uh, undoubtedly, there are tiny little pockets of bubbles that can still get yeah. lodged in the corners there. And yeah. I've had uh, air embolus uh, as a consequence even when you think you've done a perfect uh, de-airing. Yeah, well, and, course, and the, um, technique, the technique to overcome that is to rotate the uh, hub, the side arm upwards, and then put it like this, put it like this. I can't see for your put hands. put it like that. Can you see now? Yeah. Okay. Like this and like that. And always click against. And this okay. will actually Oscillate allow the it. air to, to come Oscillate out. Oscillate it. Zahid has yeah. a comment. I, yeah. was, I mean, if you are absolutely not sure there is, uh, if you are not sure that there is air in there, one of the things that I do is I take 10% of contrast, very, very diluted contrast, when I flush the sheet, and I flush it with that 10% contrast, the contrast actually stays all the way to the tip. So when you're advancing the device, you will have an interface between the contrast and the air. If, if there is air in there, you'll be able to see it very easily. That makes sense. OK. Mm -hmm. So uh, now we are have to f make the final decision about the size. You have to keep in mind, I'm, I will not distract you, but the 18-millimeter uh, Oclotec device has actually 18 on one side and 16 on the other side. So it's a little bit smaller than the 18-millimeter uh, AGA device or St. Jude device. But it should still be OK, because we measured si six millimeters. So we are still uh, twice the diameter of the, of the uh, PFO, even if it's uh, measured with a stretched balloon. But it's a little bit at the limit. It's a little bit at the limit, because you want to have at least twice the diameter of the balloon stretch diameter. We measured eight, so 16. We measured six or seven, mm -hmm. 14. Mm -hmm. And we have 16 on the right What's side. What's the next so bigger size on Aquatech? The next bigger size is then much bigger than with the uh, Amplatzer because it's uh, 25, 20, but that yeah. is 23, 25. Yes, yes. Whereas the uh, AGA device, St. Jude device, has 18, 25. Mm. So it's a little bit dis yes. dis uh, c uh, concordant, okay. right? Uh, Neil, is the 16, 18 still OK for you? Just a second. We have a comment from the audience. Yeah. Actually, 25 in an older patient like this, why would you go smaller when you can go higher to make sure it doesn't? What's the, what's the disadvantage yeah. of bigger? That's, well, that's a very good point. So in general, uh, if, you, if you oversize the uh, device, the PFO device, the disadvantage may be that uh, the uh, umbrellas are not uh, in contact with the septum anymore. And that is especially when you have a big aortic root the uh, umbrellas are spread away, and then you have a gap in between the septum and the two umbrellas. That's usually not the case with a 25 millimeter device. But when you go for a 30 or 35 millimeter device, that may happen. Uh, because with 25, it's usually not a problem. Usually, I stick to the 25. But for the reasons Neil mentioned, to reduce the amount of material, 
I think it's okay in this case to go for the 18, uh, uh, especially because the septum, that was also a comment from the audience, the septum uh, secundum is not very thick. If it is very thick, then the risk of partially dislodgement into the PFO tunnel would be larger, would be, would be more. But, but I think 18, 16 is okay here. And Stefan's suggestion. Yeah. <laughs> hold on, hold on. So uh, if it yeah. embolizes or it slips into the tunnel, then now it's clear who is responsible for that. <laughs> yes, right, taking, right. taking responsibility is part of growing up, Stefan. Yeah, I love taking a lasso to retrieve it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, 16, 18. As mm -hmm. I often say to uh, <coughs> the, the colleagues or juniors I'm working with, you make the decision and I will support whichever decision you make. So we are going to support your decision. Right, Don't feel... Right. Concerned about that. Okay. Obviously, we will blame you at the <laughs> end, <laughs> but we yes. support your decision. Yes, yes. <laughs> you support, but you blame me. Yeah. Oh, of course. Yeah. yeah. You'll be fine. Okay. So, uh, who, who in the audience uh, has used the Octotech uh, devices? Octotech. In general, ASD quite or PFO or ASD PFOs. Yeah, oh. quite a number. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, can I have the device, David? I don't think you have Oclitec in the US, do you? No. <coughs> so the, uh, most of you have seen the, the uh, St. Jude AGA device. Uh, uh, the Oclitec device is looking a little bit different, uh, and that is because on the um, left atrial side, there is no hub. There is a hub only on the right atrial side. And uh, this is uh, done to a different, to a different uh, well, design of the, of the wire mesh. Uh, then it's different that there is a coating, I think it's gold coating, something like that, which may facilitate ingrowth of, uh, of uh, endothelium and Host, may reduce Can, you, can you show it on fast, please, on fast? Okay. Just show it okay. on fast. Yeah. Okay, yeah, and there are two disks of material, right? Two one on the left side and one on the right. Exactly, and uh, when you look at this, uh, both discs have some fabric inside. I think it's uh, Dacron. And show us the central waste, please. Can you okay. show that to the camera? Okay. Oh, we don't see it. Yeah, okay, good. Good? Good. Okay. So, so it's just a couple of millimeters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good. So now uh, it's actually not a screw as with the uh, AGA device, it's a little ball. And this ball will be captured by the capsule, which is at the tip of the delivery system. But before we attach it there, we should uh, uh, slide over the introducer. Now, for those of you who haven't used the Oclitec, if you've not used the Oclitec, put your hand up, never used the Oclitec. This is the most difficult part of using it, I think, engaging the, uh, particularly for old people, for, and I don't mean old patients, I mean for old operators. Stefan, um, won't have any trouble, <laughs> but uh, so it let's, is, let's it's focus uh, on this so we can see. So I, a, I it's have a two-man job. It's a two-man job, pretty much. Whereas the uh, if you just have a screw attachment or no attachment at, at all, like with the uh, gore septal occluder. So I I have introduced the delivery cable into a sheath. I'm just just doing the knife and sheath with this on the table, and now I have this. Uh, this uh, handle yeah. here. Can, can you show that to us? Because it would yeah. be easy to forget. Yeah. Remember, we need a loading pod, really. It's not really the delivery sheath. It's a loading pod in okay. order to constrain the device. And you can see it. You've just used the nine French, yeah. the short nine French sheath that you used at the beginning of the procedure. Yeah, exactly. So which is good. It's uh, economical. Mm -hmm. So now let's focus on the tip. I have here the, the handle, which allows me to... Uh, uh, so now it's, something comes out here. This is a kind of a, looks like a clamp. Huh? I, w I will rotate it. No, no, no just stay, stay there. Uh -huh, Look uh -huh. at the picture there. Yeah, yeah. Look there. So I'm no, Stefan, stay move there. your left hand away. Yeah, yeah. Thank no, you. it's actually good now. So I'm, I'm rotating. You can see it, it, it has uh, yeah. two little, uh, let's say, two little hucks. When I release it, then it comes in again. When I pull it out, it comes out again. Okay. Now, in order to attach it... That's great, Stefan. Don't move from that position. You, you may think it, the best way is to do it like no, this here. No, you moved here. it. Thank you. But it's not actually... When you w can turn around the um, umbrella and have it flat. Like this, you mean? Yeah, okay. like this. Mm -hmm. One second. Don't 
no, no. Don't no, drop no. it. Huh? There we go. That's right. Ah. That's right. Okay. Anybody ever dropped a device onto the floor while they were doing a procedure? How's that? Ah, you see, after I put my hand up, quite a number put theirs. <laughs> now you can turn. Now it should be fixed. Okay. So the ball was grabbed by these little two, uh, what is that, little two hooks, and I released the handle here, and then the, the these bowl hooks, grabbers. The ball grabbers, and so, so the ball grabbers went back into the delivery cable and have pulled in the, uh, the ball at the device, pulled it in, into the delivery cable. But host, just a second. Yeah. Uh, just can you tilt that, show everybody the articulation? Mm -hmm. It articulates nicely. I mean, you still have. Uh, a certain amount of tension on the device when it's in the septum because of the strength of the delivery cable. But and it tilts rather nicely, mm -hmm. which so helps. Which is the difference to the uh, St. Jude device. Yeah. So now what is, what is the next very important step? The Oclotech uses, what is the next step I should not forget? Sorry. What is the minute. next step? Let me just... Uh, To screw and lock it. To yeah. lock at the mm -hmm. um, distal end of the, oh, sorry, proximal end of the delivery cable. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Can you so show us that, please, yeah. close up? Okay. So I have to screw this down or up to the blue handle. And this makes sure that the ball grabbers cannot come out of the delivery cable anymore. Okay. And show us now that you can't... Uh well, if you pull very strongly, obviously you still could, could remove it, but it's now reasonable tight here, it's reasonable connected. But no, show us the handle, Horst, mm -hmm. and how that um, <coughs> advancing that collar, the blue, the blue collar, stops you actually engaging it. So show us the trigger. Okay, let, yeah. yeah. So, now so usually I would just, just pull here. But I can't do it anymore no, because the red thing is, is, uh, is locked up. So it's a good mechanism to, mm -hmm. uh, to stop you accidentally mm -hmm. releasing things. OK, so should we flush the sheath mm -hmm. intermittently? Yeah, mm -hmm. So now, next step will be to pull back the device into just flush. Hmm? Next step will be to uh, pull back the device into the uh, uh, nine French sheath. And I will flush the sheath to make it air free. I thought Stefan was doing this. Mm -hmm. Stefan is doing this, yes. <laughs> OK, so now what is important, let, let's look at the tip. Not, not so important for, for uh, PFOs, but for ASDs. So if you, if you have the device like this, you may think that's OK because it's, it's very smooth. You can just insert it. But when you do this with the ASD device, it may happen that you are not able to advance the device out of the sheath in, inside of the heart. And to overcome that problem, you have to really pull it back until it's completely inside of the delivery sheath. And that is because the design of the, of the wire mesh is different from the uh, St. Jude a Amplatzer device. If you don't do this, it, there will be just a, a, a resistance when you want to push it out of the 9 French sheath inside of the body. But again, the PFO device is so small and so soft that it's not so important for this case, but it's important to know when you use the Octotech device. Now Stefan is inserting it. OK, here, when, when, when he's inserting the delivery sheath into the valve of the Mullins sheath, it's important to advance it up to the point where you feel some resistance, but not more than that. Because when you push too hard, what happens is that the tip of the 9 French sheath actually gets crumpled inside of the Mullins sheath, and then you have a resistance between the a valve of the mullen sheath and the shaft of the mullen sheath. So just advance carefully up, up until you feel contact and then stop. 
Okay, so next step will be to advance the device into the Marlin sheath. Now he is advancing it up to the uh, tip of the mullen sheath. We are now, where is the tip of the mullen sheath now? Well, it's no longer in the pulmonary vein, we don't think. Correct. It's not a problem just to, to understand this. It's not in the pulmonary vein. We pull, uh, okay. So what do you see now on the screen? What do you see now? Sinner. Sinner? Uh -huh. What do you see now? Well, we can see the uh, distal part of the device. Yeah, but it is important to mention that because there is no hub on the left atrial side of the uh, Oculotech device, it's difficult to see. When you thin it like this, then it's clear. But when you just fluoro, you may not be able to see the tip of the left atrial disc. And then you advance and advance, and all of a sudden you are far, far out. So it's important to pay attention because that's the difference to the uh, Amplatzer device. Okay, so now you can slowly advance up to the tip of the sheath. You see on fluoro, it's really difficult to see. Post, just stop there. Uh, yeah. Post, you've obviously got uh, Bushra who's going to direct you, but the possibilities for the tip of the sheath to enter some structures that you may mm -hmm. not want to enter. You mm -hmm. mentioned one earlier. Mm -hmm. We don't want to deliver the device into the... No idea. Yeah. And where is the tip of the sheath now? Uh, Busha, show us your picture, but yeah. don't comment. Some comments from the audience. Where is the tip of the sheath now? Yeah. Mitral valve. Uh-huh. So it's a very good technique to close off the orifice of the mitral valve when you deploy a big device in that position. Yes, I, saw, I saw Shaq Qureshi do that once, mm -hmm. but fortunately it wasn't a human being, it was an animal. Okay. <laughs> okay, so what does that mean? This means we have to uh, carefully pull back the sheath a little bit. Okay, stop. The, well, yeah, by all means carry on, but another thing we could do there to get that uh, mm -hmm. sheath out of the left ventricle. And just pull it back and rotate. To which direction? Rotate. Counterclockwise. Counterclockwise? Uh-huh. We want it pointing in a cranial direction. And of course, the other structure uh, that you could be entering, of course, is the left atrial appendage. Sachin? Are you saying something? So, Busha, are we clear of the mitral valve now? Uh, you are you're still very close to still it, Still very though. close, huh? Yeah. We now want clockwise torque. Clockwise Whatever we need to do to get, the, mm -hmm. to get the tip of the sheath pointing more cranially. And we want to go more posterior. That's why clockwise rotation. Okay. Now it's at the level of the appendage. When you look at the TEE, at the level of the appendage. But now we are, I think we are now quite in the middle of the uh, LA, yeah. of the left atrium. Yeah, you so are. I think this would be a good place to expose the uh, left atrial disc. I will zoom in a little bit. But it, it's good for, for you to see how, you know, it's not a bad idea to have additional imaging with transesophageal or indeed intracardiac uh, echo in closing PFOs, and there are people who prefer to close PFOs uh, without, without additional imaging other than fluoroscopy. And you can see you might get yourself into a little bit of trouble. So we wouldn't advise that for novice operators. So Neil, the Does other thing know? is, can you not be in the pulmonary vein with the, sh the Yeah, sheet? could be, yeah, That's sure. That's probably the easier. Yeah. That's so now nicely you can back the septum. You can see now that the left atrial disc is exposed, and now we want to have, a, a, let's say, a particular position of the delivery cable or the, the device, the umbrella, should be parallel to the septum. When you look at the 30-degree uh, view on TE, it looks 
quite reasonable, it's almost parallel. But then we would also like to see the long axis of the uh, septum. Bosha, can you give us? Yeah, thank you. Looks good. Huh? It's actually pretty good right now, yeah, right? Looks we very don't good, have to it? rotate. We can just gently pull back the whole thing until we are touching the septum. Stefan, don't forget to breathe, OK? I, I am, I am. I'm still, I'm not blue yet. I'm not cyanotic yet. It's very easy to forget to breathe when you're doing uh, something like that live and with more than the usual stress. Do you feel some resistance, Stefan? No, not yet, not yet. When you look at the uh, echo, let's think no, about I whether do. you can no, pull a little bit more. Uh -huh. No, I feel sure. a little resistance. You feel yes. resistance, yes. okay. Yes. Don't pull too strong, yeah. but you should feel something with this device. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Could we center, please? Center the fluoro. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And we would also like to see, an, again, the long axis view. Thank on you. the short axis view on T, it looks good, but... You've got both there? The 90 degree so view. This is your long axis view here. That's lovely. That's lovely. Ah, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'll deploy the radiatorial portion. One second. Maybe push you, it, do you, you mind? Just it. You pushed one, it, huh? One, wait, one wait, wait. click, um, yeah, you like push bigger, it. short, yeah. um, less depth, please. Less, bigger, that way? Big, yeah. Bigger picture, less depth, yeah, that's good. No, less depth. Yeah, I'm sorry, just, I'll just get my picture again. Yeah, and you're going, oh, that's, yeah. yeah, okay, good. Or maybe back one. Back one, yeah. yeah. Maybe, maybe it's between, between the two. Yeah. Maybe it's between yeah. the two. Yeah. Okay. How's that? Come on, Stefan. We want a cup of tea. Mm -hmm. All right. So come back a little bit first before I release it. Keep breathing. I am. I am. You may pull a little bit stronger. Huh? Yeah. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Don't Very push good. too hard. Don't push uh -huh. too big, hard. Big echo, please. Big echo. Jürgen? Yeah, thank you. Okay, good. Okay. Maybe Looks some. Uh, any, anybody want to do anything else on the echo? See anything else on the echo? Quite important at this stage. Color, we'd like to see some color, please, Busher. And it, it's also worth interrogating the atrial septum at this stage because you might not have seen an additional uh, shunt, additional defect. Uh, until look, now. look at the fluoro as it is now. It looks to me that the delivery cable is pushing a little bit towards the septum. So can you fluoro again? Mm -hmm. And maybe you can just pull a little bit. So, okay, now it's better. Okay, okay. patient is moving now a little uh -huh. bit. Okay, good. So okay. we are now looking on, on echo whether the septum is in between the two umbrellas in all different views. Just a second. Lucy's taking photographs, but it's verboten. <laughs> Are you happy with this device? Uh, so far, yes. Can we? Sorry, did you show color, uh, Bushra? I didn't. Uh, I did. I can show it again if you like. Sorry, I was distracted by being the policeman for Lucy and her camera. We're only joking, by the way. You can. So I'm just. As I'm at um, transverse plane zero degrees. And I'm just going down the septum, making sure I can see tissue in between the two discs and there's no abnormal flow. And then I go around to 50-ish. Sorry, the image quality is going a little bit. And that looks good. I can see septum in between the two discs, uh, posteriorly and anteriorly. And then around to 90, so the long axis view. Stefan? Yes, yes. Are you happy? I'm happy, I think, yes. Yeah. Anything happy. else you want to see? Uh, no, no. There's, there's one more thing. Yeah. And that is when, when you look at fluoro again, it looks to me, and also an echo, it looks that there's still quite a bit of tension. So the, at the inferior edge and also the posterior edge of the device, the device is pushed into the left atrium a little bit. And to overcome that, is, uh, one option is to look on fluoro again and rotate the sheath, pull back the sheath a little bit more, and rotate the sheath towards the, don't push the whole system. Uh -huh. Don't push the whole system. 
Okay, but pull back the sheath now. Uh -huh. Just a sheath, right? Pull, pull back the sheath, and then rotate the sheath towards the... Uh, no, pull it back. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Just pull it back. More, uh -huh. more. Okay, good. Uh -huh. And now rotate the sheath so that it shows to the... Oh! So, rotate the sheath so that it points towards the uh, free wall of the right atrium, so the left side of the screen. So more clockwise, huh? Yeah, clockwise, what, what, yeah. What was the exclamation post? Huh? You exclaimed. Well, someone was resting on the table, and when I uh, released the table, the table was moving. But it's okay now. Okay. Can you even rotate more, the sheet more? more? Yeah, okay. okay, this this may give you a little bit different orientation of the delivery cable, so there is less tension applied to the device in the septum. Even more? Okay, uh, now mm -hmm. it's good. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Okay, so uh, can we release it now? Final check? Yeah, I think so. We're I happy think with so, that. Huh? Everybody yeah. happy? Yeah. Yeah, okay. happy. So, Stefan, would you like to release it? Sh show me how to release it. So, uh, to release it, you have to unscrew the red thing again, unscrew mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. and then pull. Okay, unscrew okay. and pull. Unscrew first. And what is import important during uh, release? O other side, I think. Uh, Turn to okay. the other this way. way? Yeah. Uh -huh. What is important only one when you way it will release. Yeah. Kay. When you release it, it's important not to push and not to pull. It should be in a neutral position. Okay, and then pull? No, this this is then just pull. Show it let no this horse take your hand the away. Whole thing out? This uh -huh. way? Can yeah. we see uh, the hands close please? Uh -huh. And we'll have picture in picture of Stefan's hand. Okay, this has to be pulled. This has take to be pulled take your left hand away, Stefan. Please okay. take your left hand away. Thank you. There we go, okay. I'm released, actually. Mm -hmm. Pull it back. Yeah, okay. and Floro, please. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Beautiful. Well, we have to applaud you for that. So back, back to Echo, please. I'm just looking at it on 3D. I'll just go to 2D in one second. So I'm just looking at it here. Left atrial view. Uh, mitral valve is here. Right upper pulmonary vein is up here. And here, here's a fossa where there's dropout, and here's the disc sitting nicely uh, next to the aortic root. If I just swing that image round, just to show you the um, right atrial side. But should do you sometimes use this device in uh, in, Pap in Cambridge? This is the one device we haven't used actually. So it's a it's a first for you. It is, yeah. And you can see the first in Bushra. <laughs> SVC up here, IVC down here, coronary sinus here, and can you see the disc sitting beautifully tucked in there on the septum very nicely and well away from this ridge. So that's good, and I've just switched to 2D now. I'll just show you color as we go around. So you can see the, this, the, the profile of the disc has changed now. It's been released and it's sitting nicely in line with the septum. There's tissue on either side nicely. There's no abnormal flow. And I'm just going to swing round towards the aortic root now and just rotating the probe just to see. I've make sure I've got tissue again on both sides, nicely caught between the disc. There's no abnormal flow. Looks nice, and then finally just a zero quickly. But st if you've just uh, stay in that projection, please, yeah. Stefan. Yes, yes. I mean, I I'm sure you'd have been okay with a 25 millimeter device, but you see how close even you are to the aorta now, even yes, with I can that see it. Yes, 18 yes. millimeter device. And anything you can do to minimize contact with things like the aorta, obviously, uh, can only be good, I think. And if that means using a slightly smaller device, then so be it. We compliment you on the choice of size of device, uh, Stefan. Until, until tomorrow, <laughs> when we have to retrieve it. <laughs> okay. Two more things, Neil. Let me show again the release yep. mechanism, because this is some, many people are asking for this. Yep. And, and you see, can you see my, okay. And I, you should actually see both, so my, the, uh, okay, so like this, okay, good. Yeah, that's good. So intuitively, when you, when you look at the device like this one, you think you have to, to push to do something. But actually, uh, in order to bring out the, uh, what is this, the ball grabbers, you have to do the opposite. You have to pull the black thing. So this is opening, this is opening the, the uh, ball grabbers. And in the neutral state, it's like that, because there's a spring in between here. So this is opening, and now it's fixed. 
And uh, in order to, to have a fixed connection during the delivery of the device, we can screw it here. So now I cannot do this movement anymore. But when I want to release it, I have to open the red thing. And now I can pull on the black thing. And this opens the uh, ball grabbers. And that releases the device. And so if any of you haven't really had a good look at this device, then obviously now, now you've got it fresh in your memory, is a good time to go to the Oculotech stand and ask them if you could play with the delivery cable and device. And there's a couple of comments there, please. Uh, I have a question <coughs> to Professor Horst regarding... Uh, no, you have to ask Stefan the question. Stefan, it's he's okay. Sure. For, for his suggestion for uh, best device for a long tunnel P4. You mean your question is, can you use this for a long tunnel PFO? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I have to defer that to Horst. I haven't used this device in any PFO, actually. So I don't know if, what your experience is with using it, it, it in it a It really depends PFO. not only on the length of the tunnel, but also the stiffness of the tunnel. In, in very rare cases, the uh, tunnel is very stiff. And then you should not use one of the umbrella devices. Most of the tunnels are pliable. That means you can use an umbrella device like this. But what you are doing then is, if it is a very long tunnel, you are distorting the septum. And theoretically, this is not based on any data. This may, a high, may implement a higher risk of uh, atrial fibrillation. So if there is a long tunnel, then my preferred device is something like the uh, Premier device, for example. But uh, to answer your question, can you use it? Yes, I think you can use it. And definitely, the risk of atrial fibrillation is just a theoretical concern. It's not really based on data yet. What would you consider a long tunnel length from your perspective? And how more would you than 10, 15, More than 10, okay. 15 millimeters on balloon sizing mainly. Mm -hmm. It's not mm -hmm. echo so much, but it's more balloon mm -hmm. sizing, which shows you the stiffness of the septum. Also, I have so another question or comment. Yeah. It's, just a, it's another comment about the delivery, the release mechanism. So sometimes with this device, when you activate the release mechanism, the delivery cable just stays where it is. Um, and I think what you showed earlier on about rotating the sheath, you, if you do that as well after activating the release, it can just pull the um, pull the delivery cable clear, but sometimes when you when you operate that spring, it just stays there and sits. So you have to sort of move it off by rotating the sheath. It's a good point. Mm -hmm. Good point. Yeah. So what to do with the sheath now? Just say, say it. Say it. Say Ask it. the audience, Neil. What what to do with the sheath? Uh, right. What are we going to do so with the sheath? Make loop. Save loop. Leave it there for follow-up angiography or what? Yeah, that's a good idea, yeah, yeah. as long as you put him on aspirin. Come on, We're gonna, what are we going to do with the sheet? We're going to pull it out uh, at our center. We make a stitch figure, figure of eight and then just tie it. Figure well, of eight? Did you hear that? Mm -hmm. It's uh, take it out and put in a, a, a Z suture. Mm -hmm. So that's one option. The, actually, we could show this here if you want. Why not? We don't use it routinely for then don't small do sheet size. But well, occasionally we use it. Actually, it depends upon the hospital strategy. So in one hospital we do it, in the other one not. I don't like it. OK, so then we don't do it. Well, so what, it depends what, what Stefan thinks. Stefan? I would just, uh, I would personally exchange it for a short sheath and then have the ACT come down to a safe range and then just pull it and apply pressure, manual pressure. But I think uh, you would leave the longer sheath in and have him pull it uh, on the floor usually, right? Well, uh, what is Im several things are important. First uh, is the question, can you pull the sheet immediately? The patient is on 10,000 units of heparin. Can you pull it immediately or not? Of course you can. It just depends how long you want to prepare, be prepared to uh, stand. But as it's Stefan who's going to be pressing, it doesn't matter anyway. You can go and have a cup of coffee <laughs> yeah. while he's doing that. <laughs> right, yeah. right. So the answer is yes, you could pull it immediately. And you could even apply a compression bandage immediately and don't use manual compression because you have venous pressure only, which is very low. It's about three millimeters of mercury. So uh, when, you, when you apply a good compression bandage, it will stay there, no problem. I no, uh, don't like that either. OK. Steph, um, Horst, we have a comment, please. Yeah. Uh, would you like to perform uh, contrast echo through the sheets? Uh, contrast echo through the sheet, that's a good point. Yeah, let's it's see it. I'll let you do that. Uh, but but right, I, don't that want, I don't want a yeah. Z-suture or compression bandage. Uh, OK, so it's a different issue. Let's, let's first finish the discussion about the sheet, and then we come back to the okay. question about contrast. Okay. Uh, so, so one option is to remove it immediately, apply a compression bandage. Yeah. Second no, option no, no, no. is yeah, no, right. no option. Yeah, it's an option, but you don't want it. OK. So uh, the other option is to leave it there and wait until uh, uh, ACT is normal or until the heparin has gone. 
And then it's the question, can we leave the long sheath or have it exchange for a short sheath? When, when, yeah. we went to leave, we want to leave it for a couple of hours. Can we leave the long sheath or can we? It's an important question. I tell you why. Well, Audience? Uh, anybody like to make a comment? I would prefer a short sheath. Short sheet. Why? Uh, because I think these long sheets are extremely thrombogenic. I don't want any long sheet in the body okay. for such a long time, no matter what the ACT is. That's one important reason. And there's a, a second reason which may, may uh, yep. force you to use a short sheet. What is that? I had a, I had a problem with the long sheets. The patient, uh, who I left the long sheets, suddenly had pain in her liver region. And exactly. We, we did an ultrasound, and the tip of the sheath showed into the uh, hepatic vein. So yeah. that was the reason I never uh, leave a long sheath in, exactly. in, in patient. OK, so these are very good reasons. And we had the, the same problem. And uh, these are very good reasons to use the short sheath. As an alternative, and that is our practice, we just pull the long sheath back until it is only sticking in the vein about 10 centimeters. And our nurses at the ward are very well trained not just to, to uh, flush the sheath. So even if thrombus formation occurs inside of the sheath, with our practice, there is no risk of pulmonary embolism. But it's important to educate your nurses, because, or the doctors as well, of course, because they may think, OK, let's flush the sheath or let's use this as a venous axis for infusion or whatsoever. And then if you, if you don't aspirate very carefully, there may be thrombus formation inside of the sheath. So these are the, the, the different options we have here. Okay. Let's do a quick cine right. before we yeah. go back. Huh? Right. OK, there's one more thing what we do routinely is to cine the device. That's like when you climb the Mount Everest, you put a, a what is that, the flag there with your name to make sure that everybody can see that you have achieved your goal. And the second reason is, if there is any concern about uh, any discussion later on, well, is the device still in place, the patient has some arrhythmia whatsoever, I do another Cinerun, an AP projection. Is this AP? This is close to AP, yeah. OK, can, uh, because if you do it in, in an AP projection, you can use this as a comparison when you do a plain X-ray. You don't have to bring the patient back to the cath lab necessarily. You can just use a, you can see the position mm -hmm. of the sheath. Mm -hmm. It's pointing towards the liver veins or towards the renal veins. So that's why it's important to pull it back. So uh, then you can use this fluoro one, which was performed here in the cath lab with any X-ray, which is uh, performed later on. I like Barrett's idea of exchanging for a shorter sheath. I must admit, it's just practically slightly easier, I think, than this great dangling thing. Would you like to follow that suggestion? I, yes. I would. I like he, the short sheath too. As well. I like okay, short that's sheets, fine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we have it on the table, so we don't have to invest more money than we already did. So that's acceptable then. Good. I'll just see uh, anybody you want. Oh, somebody wanted a contrast uh, bubble, Graham, but oh. we'll wait till you put the okay. short sheet. So when, yeah, that's uh -huh. important. If you want to do a bubble test at this time, it's very difficult to accomplish this with a long sheath. So this is actually another reason to exchange for the short sheath, because then you can do a very nice bubble study by just Post, injecting blood. You're supposed blood to be assisting Stefan. You're supposed to be assisting Stefan. He's having to cross the cath lab to get the equipment. <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> so let so me exchange it for a short sheet, huh? It's a terrible yeah. assistant. That's it's right. really terrible. Actually, what I will do, I will move into the other room and prepare the next patient. And uh, Stefan will do another bubble test. And Post, uh, what's the, um, the format here in this sort of theater area is uh, designated from 2 o'clock till 6 o'clock. Is that right? So you're just going to cycle the cases. Yeah, uh, we, will, we will continue with cases until we are finished. And uh, during the turnover time, you are actually supposed uh, to, uh, to dance a little bit or to sing a song. And uh, I will let you know when we are ready to show you with, uh, start with the next case. OK, thank you. I That's what you didn't wanted bring, to hear. Didn't bring my squeeze box. But uh, thanks to everybody in the lab. And uh, well done, Stefan. Thank you, thank you. First Pleasure. time, uh, Pleasure. thanks to uh, Bushra and your team also. Thank and you. And to the patient, of course. Is she uh, is conscious? Yes, he is. He's conscious, yes. Can we say thank you? And he speaks you? English very well. Ah, and we'd They're like all to say thanking you. Yes. We'd yes. like to say thank you. All right. Oder vielen Dank.
Uh, just for the bubble study. Uh, well, if you want to see the bubble study, you could stay with us. Uh, yes, we're staying. Okay, we're not, and just uh, hang on anywhere. for just a second, and I'll show you the Some bubble study. Some of the study. audience have had enough. Okay, yeah, I can see that. I can see that. Oh, you can see us. Gleich, gleich. Oh, for the bubble study. Ushra? Yes? Just out of interest, um, when you do uh, device closures, do you, do you do a sort of check bubble gram at the end or not? Uh, not? Not routinely, unless we're worried about the device in some way. Okay. Okay. Anything else you do differently procedurally, um, either, either with the uh, echo or actually the device and access or anything? I'm ready. Yep, yep. Sure. We, uh, yes. Yes, what I'll do is I'll aspirate some blood, and then I'll just continuously inject and aspirate, and inject and aspirate. Are you ready, Bashar? Yeah, we're ready. Good. Mm -hmm. Let me do this. Uh, so inject, aspirate, inject, aspirate. Are you on freeze by any chance? Or? Oh, here we go. <laughs> no, we're live. Come on, Stefan. Okay. More, more. Yeah, here it comes. Here it comes. There we go. That's okay. There we go. Okay. So there are a few bubbles that are crossing, yeah. huh? Yeah, it right. looks okay. like it's coming through the Which device. Which is normal. Rather yeah, than actually through any hole. At this stage, that's okay. Yeah. So Hopefully. Okay, that's really very nice. Thank you very much. Uh, for doing that uh, pleasure, pleasure for us. And Neil, I'll just finish with a, the 3D picture here. Yeah. Just to show you what the device looks like now it's been released. Very nice. So this is the left atrial view. And I've marked the mitral valve, or just the annulus is just there. The yeah. right upper pulmonary vein is here. The aortic okay. knuckle is here. And you can see that's perfect sizing of that device sitting very snugly just under the root there at the top of the fossa ovalis, which is here. And then on the right atrial side, this is what it looks like. So again, you've got your SVC up there, IVC, and then just this here is your coronary sinus entry. There's this ridge we were talking about just coming up to the top of the fossa here, and there's the device sitting nicely there. So it's, it looks, looks right. very good. Well, that's a very nice demonstration from uh, all of you. I'm going to hang around. But I expect people are going to have a cup of tea or a glass of water. Great. Well, thanks for watching us. Uh, Thank we'll you, see Stephen. you in a bit. Well okay. done. Thank you.